Hello, everyone, again. Um, if I could get your uh, attention just for a few minutes. Um, so uh, welcome to the uh, next uh, uh, keynote session. Um, as we mentioned earlier this year in ITC, we have a number of keynotes and, uh, and visionary speakers. Um, at the beginning or in the middle of some of these uh, sessions, we would like to make some announcements. Uh, um, and as the year one doing, was doing earlier, some maybe challenging questions remind you of what, uh, what, uh, what happened in the past 15 years with ITCs and publications and folks involved. Um, what I would like to do is uh, actually uh, uh, make an announcement with the, uh, uh, the Shark Tank uh, style uh, panel that we had uh, Monday afternoon. Um, w there was an idea explored by the steering committee members that uh, we want to um, um, uh, make some changes in our traditional Monday panel. And uh, one idea that was approved was we're in DC. We have a lot of uh, folks who are interested in, in sponsoring uh, small businesses and ideas. What if, if we could bring some real VCs, uh, venture capitalists, to, to come in and, and, and judge and ask questions of folks who have uh, small businesses or have aspiration of uh, building uh, small businesses around their technologies? And uh, we brought, uh, we invited actually six, six individuals. Four came um, to uh, cancel the last second, but regardless, uh, these are uh, real VCs that they literally came with their checks and cash in hand to actually select some projects. And uh, we had uh, selected from the number of uh, folks who expressed interest in uh, making a pitch to these guys. And out of that, the idea was that if they have any interest in any of those projects, there, there will be follow-up discussions. Uh, so I'm happy to announce two things. One is that they are already expressing interest in some of the technologies that were uh, presented, which is great. So um, uh, that was the whole objective. I think that mission was accomplished. And I already getting uh, folks inside this room and, uh, and throughout the conference that they're actually interested in making a pitch next year. So that's great. And the second thing is that uh, we also tasked VCs to select uh, who made the best pitch, not just from presentation standpoint or necessarily a business plan overall, from the standpoint of technology, uh, the potential of that technology to be able to, uh, so the individual can build a business around it, and of course, in addition to other, other materials that were needed. So I'm happy to announce that uh, they came up with co-winners and uh, um, uh, first uh, is Dr. Asid, uh, Navid Asadi from University of Florida with the title Printed Circuit Boards, a Holistic Approach to Assurance. And the company name is Red Pyramid LLC. And the second is Louis Unger uh, with the title A New Paradigm for Testing Electronics with the company ATE Solutions. If I just ask those folks to stand up so they can be recognized if they're in the room. That's TM Mack from ATE Solutions. And Navid Asadi should be somewhere. There you go, that's Navid Asadi over there. So thank you very much for making the pitch, and hopefully we'll see you guys back again next year. So with that, I'm going to have to hand it over to Dr. Yerwan Zurian to moderate the session. Thanks a lot, Mark. We have lots of exciting things here at ITC. Uh, this was one of them, this uh, nice contest that we went through. If you like it, please write down in your survey at the end. We may uh, try to organize it again in the future. If you think it's a good idea, it's a good uh, training for our youth, for our uh, entrepreneurial minds, then we can repeat it again in the future if you want. Mm -hmm. um, today, I wanted to quickly brief you on what we have done yesterday, you're part of it. We have done uh, the first two keynotes uh, in the morning and in the afternoon. Today we do have two more keynotes to come. You will hear one of them uh, momentarily and the next one in the afternoon from IBM. We do have uh, two more keynotes tomorrow from EPFL from Switzerland and from Volkswagen from Germany. Okay? So these two are coming as well tomorrow. 
Uh, with that, we'll complete our keynote circle. Our visionary circle started yesterday again in the morning by Synopsys with then PDF solutions in the afternoon. Today we do have two more visionaries, one in the morning. Joe will do from Mentor, will do the visionary talk in the morning. And then Rafiq will be with us in the afternoon to cover Mubadala and the investment side. Uh, then we do have the ATE companies, Teradyna Advantest, tomorrow again with visionary talks. Uh, please make sure, not only when you attend the paper sessions, but also at the keynotes and the visionary talks, please also put your, your feedback. We would like to hear your feedback that will help us plan for the future, for next year and beyond. Now I have the pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this morning. Our keynote speaker is Kevork Keshishian. This is a French spelling, C -A -G -S -S -S. So uh, Kevork is, uh, is with us. He's the senior vice president of engineering at NXP. He joined NXP recently in April 2019 as senior VP. Uh, he is in charge of a number of things. Uh, he has global teams on architecture, IP, SOCs. His target devices are automotive microcontrollers, automotive processors, media processors, industrial IoT, networking, almost everything NXP does, I guess. Uh, he worked before being with NXP. He has been the VP, senior VP of engineering with Qualcomm. He managed, again, global teams, especially concentrating on Sp uh, Snapdragon SOC team. He holds his bachelor degree from the American University of Beirut and his master's degree from Concordia University in Montreal. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, it's, it's good being here. Thank you, Ervan, for the invite. Uh, happy 50th IITC. This, uh, this field actually came a long way in the last uh, 50 years. It's almost as old as I am. Uh, and I still remember the time where I used to uh, argue with design managers and managers that, uh, you know, well, these are people managers that scan flops are too expensive to, uh, to integrate into SOCs. We've come a long way there. Uh, like Yervan said, it's, uh, it's been a great six months so far. I joined NXP in, uh, in April, and it's been like uh, drinking from, uh, from a, a fire hydrant. And uh, so I'm going to walk through some of the, uh, some of the aspects that uh, my team and uh, myself are involved in and show you some of the challenges. Uh, like Yervan said, NXP does a very, uh, has a very varied portfolio on lots of products, lots of markets. Uh, and I'm going to focus uh, the majority of this presentation on the auto side because that's where really the challenges are. Uh, so we are a truly a global company with uh, you know, lots of sites, lots of engineering sites. Uh, 30 plus countries is really uh, doesn't do it justice. We probably have close to 90 plus offices. Uh, most of them are engineering. Uh, 30,000 employees. Uh, you have a number about the revenue there. And then really what, uh, uh, what makes a difference is really the, the, the size of the R&D team and uh, you know, the, the breadth of the technical knowledge they have. So this is our uh, geographical locations. Uh, you know, I was hoping my travel uh, would, would slow down, but uh, it went the other way. Uh, but it's, it's, it's truly exciting to be part of this team. Uh, so our target markets, really at XP delivers into four, four different segments. Automotive, obviously. But we have a very heavy presence in industrial IoT, and there, you know, I'll mention it a bit because there's lots of similarities there on how the, the SOCs are designed. We have mobile. Surprisingly, 5G is uh, very big for us, also from an infrastructure perspective and the edge side, and of course, the communication uh, infrastructure. So uh, as most of us have been in this industry for a while, we know that there was, uh, you know, the, the cloud, things were happening in the cloud where you have you know, heavy processing involved, you know, the big machines, the servers, uh, all kinds of AI applications going on in the cloud. Uh, and then some of the aspects are listed there. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about machine learning and how it uh, pertains to auto in a bit. But the, the, the few ideas that were very important, uh, you know, just in general from an industry perspective is, is really the, uh, uh, the, the data analytics, the, the, the amount of data that goes to the cloud or is in the cloud and how we can extract information and useful information from it, but also things about security and authentication and how these things 
uh, are going to be maintained from, not just from a data security perspective, but also from uh, safety, and I'll talk about the safety aspect. And then uh, most of us on the consumer side, we, we know about uh, what's happening from the edge to node. I mean, all the processing, you see the icons there, you know, whether it's consumer type of processing, whether it's mobile, uh, personal devices. So, you know, the, these two industries uh, kind of evolved uh, in, in parallel. And then what was missing really is something in between that would, uh, would enabling technology. So there's lots of things that have to happen near the edge for various reasons. So, you know, I mentioned security, I mentioned safety, but also there's practicality of it, right? The data transfers, uh, how much people can wait for uh, certain results to come back, uh, certainly very pertinent for, uh, from an auto perspective where you have you know, these devices, uh, these vehicles moving at a very, sometimes very high speeds and th there are decisions that need to be made, but also from a practical aspect of it, how much power is consumed, uh, latencies I mentioned. And then this is where, you know, NXP with his wide portfolio, you know, comes into place. And you see at the top, we benefit from all these three paradigms, you know, within our, uh, you know, four segments. Uh, I love showing this slide. So I was lucky enough to be involved in uh, most of all these aspects. Well, maybe not the 70s, 60s and 70s. Uh, I caught the last end of it uh, when I was uh, doing internship in, in Beirut. But... Uh, you guys are familiar with these curves. Uh, there's always these waves of big things happening and then even bigger things coming next. Uh, I am very excited about this, this latest wave. I'm not going to say the last wave because uh, truly it's, it's, uh, it's, it's something that's going to fundamentally change the way we do things. And today, I mean, I'm talking about AI. Uh, today we have lots of AI in our lives. Uh, whether we know it or we don't know it, whether we're aware of it or not. And it's, uh, it's really focusing uh, how they can make things better, how they can make things more efficient, how they can make things uh, safer. And I'll talk about the, the auto aspect of it. But, and then uh, what's what exciting about NXP is we're very well positioned to benefit from, uh, from this latest wave, building on all the infrastructure and all the portfolio and all the chipsets that, uh, that we had in the past. Uh, again, a very basic stuff. So if you look at, you know, below is all kinds of uh, uh, smart uh, kind of instruments, if you would like. So it goes from, you know, all the way to the right where you see the, the vacuum cleaners, the Roomba. Most of you have seen the, uh, the YouTube videos with cats, uh, you know, sitting on top of these. Uh, then you start moving to the left and you see the complexity increasing, right? Uh, so eventually you have, you have the, the appliances, then you have the industrial robotics, which by the way is a very big field for, uh, for us. There's lots of applications there. Uh, and then the, the, the auto side where, uh, where I'm gonna spend more time today on it, and eventually robotics. So if you, if you think about this, really a car is a robot. It's some form of robot uh, that's performing lots of functions. It's, uh, it doesn't have the same kind of articulate uh, movements like like a you know like a robot, real robot, but eventually all the technology is going to lead us lead us to that one. Uh, the one item I would like to commonality on top, you know, these devices always have these four paradigms. You know, they sense lots of sensors. You know, people talk about sensor fusion in the auto industry, and then there's there's processing elements where you know really the big processing happens where it's data manipulations, transforming data, and eventually. It, they have to connect to some type of devices where actually things happen. They make things happen, whether it's actuators or uh, different type of uh, control mechanisms that actually move things and make things happen. So uh, any of the devices, and there's a variety of other devices that are in this category, have these four paradigms or these four elements. Uh, this is another interesting graph. So if you look at now moving back into automotive, if you look at the areas of growth in this industry, uh, the biggest one is really the, the two ones on the, on the left side. And then over time, you see the ADAS and autonomous driving is going to take over the other aspect, which is uh, electric vehicles and uh, the hybrid vehicles. So there's lots of technology, both from uh, the SOC, the chip side, but also from a system perspective, and, and I'll, uh, I'll talk about that a bit later, that's going into these two paradigms. And these things are not just driving the, uh, uh, the cost, 
from a semiconductor footprint perspective, but also driving the complexity. And then uh, this part actually is to highlight where I'm going to focus, where it's really the, the thinking aspect of these four paradigms. This is where you know, the heavy processing comes into play. Uh, we're moving from, uh, from an industry where it was mostly doing point solutions. You had, uh, you know, the, the, had the pump control, some of the engine control, uh, the vehicle dynamics control into uh, much larger ships. We're talking about uh, you know, tens of billions of transistors where you have you know, gateways controlling the data movement within the car. You have uh, domain controls I'm going to talk about. So these are fairly large chips that, uh, that we're, uh, we're moving into. And then you see the different vectors of uh, challenge we have. So what is, important, uh, what is important from an auto industry? Zero is a big number. Obviously, you see that. And uh, you know, the, most, the most obvious one is really uh, the, the middle one, right? You know, any failure in this industry you, leads to uh, you know, some situation that potentially can cause a loss of life. And uh, that's why the automakers take it uh, very seriously. That's why you know, they're very careful who to partner with with some of the mission critical systems. Uh, and then uh, the, on the left side is really uh, anything that has, really has to do with efficiencies. You know, it says zero wasted time. Basically, we're talking about you know, efficiencies when you know, decisions are being made within the system, efficiencies when actually people are using those, uh, those devices, those cars. You know, it could be anything as simple as you know, connecting to infrastructure to find a parking spot, which, which is very important for, you know, in the big cities, you know, talking about LA, New York, things like that, to all the way of, uh, you know, how, you, how we monitor all the different dynamics within the car. And then the, really the right one is uh, zero emissions, uh, talking completely about uh, electrification of, of, of the vehicles, right? Zero emissions there. And there's lots of technology going into that, controlling the different, uh, different aspects of, uh, of uh, operational. The underlying commonality in all of these paradigms, and this is fairly unique uh, with NXP in my opinion, is really the safety and the security aspect of it. Uh, NXP has a track record of probably over the last 50, 60 years of building on this, and that's why you know, the car makers, the tier ones, are very, very happy to partner, uh, partner with us. Quickly, uh, about the car architecture. Uh, so if you look on the, uh, the left side, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it says flat. It's basically uh, what happened is uh, this is a traditional car, uh, very mechanical, electromechanical, electrohydraulic device designed by mechanical engineers. And uh, as technology was evolving in the last 20, 30 years, they started thinking about what they can do to add you know, functionality that would benefit, benefit the user. Uh, so anywhere from, you know, basic stuff like uh, automatic windows up and down, you know, pump control, uh, all the way to some preliminary and very early on uh, uh, safety stuff like, uh, you know, ABS or, uh, you know, the uh, steering wheel control. So some of the basic stuff, and then you see it's in the diagram, it shows us kind of point solutions. The problem there is that all of these things are very, very isolated systems, and it's very difficult to have a communication between them. So there was almost no communication between these devices. Fast forward to today, and this is actually where uh, we have uh, products that already are already in the market or being released. So uh, we moved into this uh, so-called domain kind of uh, architecture from a car perspective. And any, any number of these domains would contain uh, you know, dozens and maybe you know, into uh, mid-30s kind of number of chips that are talking locally but also communicating with the rest of the systems. So communication is very important. And actually, if you look at the cost of a car, a major part of it is really today, it's all the wiring that goes into it, not just from, a, uh, from the expense of building the car, but also from operating it. So that those things are heavy, the wires are heavy. So uh, we're moving, you see where we're moving. We're moving into a paradigm where uh, there are these domain controllers with uh, very decent processing. And I'll show some uh, very simple block diagrams what I mean that processing there. And uh, there's communication happening uh, between all of them. So just walking through it, you see from, uh, 
you see the, the domain controller from vehicle dynamics, then you see the, uh, from, uh, from a sensor fusion perspective, uh, then you see from connectivity, then you see the power plane, uh, the, the vehicle dynamics, and then body and comfort. You know, these are things that uh, just monitor, monitor all the environment that people are in, but also all the operating environments. And then there's some, uh, some ADAS functionality that goes into that for, uh, for driver assist. The one interesting part, and it was, uh, you know, it was a very interesting discovery for me, is what sits in the middle. We call it the gateway controller, and this is uh, basically a network processing chip where you get uh, you know, all of the data information flowing within these domain controllers, and it's, it's truly uh, a network processor in there with uh, you know, a large number of CPUs, CPU cores, uh, and it's, it's been retrofit to to be part of that architecture. So this is, this is really where we are today, and people are, uh, like I said, already have designed for it. Some of the car models are gonna come up with this, but also uh, you know, moving in the next you know, three to five years. Now, if you start moving to the right, then we see what uh, we call it the zonal kind of uh, paradigm, where people start thinking, instead of thinking about domains, people start thinking about zones. So, uh, you know, everything per zone related to uh, radar processing, uh, uh, sensor processing, cameras would happen, instead of happening in a localized domain perspective, would happen in a particular zone. And the paradigm really there is how much processing power would you put in into these, uh, these elements? And there's lots of discussions back and forth, like I said, for, with the car makers, with you know, semiconductor providers, with tier ones, to figure out how these devices would look like. And you know, there's lots of work going on there, and it's, 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 it's fairly exciting. Okay, software. Uh, we have this concept, and it's been around for a while, that really software has to drive the complexity. You know, for, uh, for some of you who are you know, students of complexity, you know that you know, when you move from a system that has n different components to, to n plus one, sometimes the, the complexity that explodes multiple order of magnitude, right? And then really for this type of device, where it's not just the number of elements that's important, it's really the number of connections and number of potential you know, interactions that these elements are going to have, it's very important. So think about the previous slide. We have multiple processing elements per domain, and most of them have to talk to each other. And then you see how the complexity is, is really, really becoming, uh, you know, I wouldn't say it's out of control, but it's really becoming very difficult to contain, especially from a software perspective. So that graph shows really the, the number of, uh, you know, flash we have per device versus, uh, versus the number of software lines of code that, that's uh, increasing exponentially. There was, another, uh, there was another graph that showed that the, the number of lines of code in a car, it's way more than what they have in the space shuttle. Uh, just because of the, the complexity that they're dealing with. I mean, of course, there's other constraints that the space shuttle guys have, but... Uh, and then you see on the, on the left side what, what's driving this complexity from a software perspective. Uh, first of all, I mean, think of, uh, think of uh, you know, sets of chipsets kind of structure where software has to connect to, to all of them and then have some coherency, whether we're talking about actual coherency or you know, some type of uh, heterogeneous computing where you have different ISA, you have, you know, arrays of ARM cores, you have DSP cores, you have AI kind of uh, cores that are part of that. And then you need to have a software that's communicating between all of these devices and controlling what's happening. Uh, if I start from the bottom, it's really the energy efficiency. Uh, it goes all the way from planning the most optimal route to you know, how is your engine behaving uh, with respect to load, with respect to, uh, you know, weather conditions, and how is the, the, the interaction between the engine and the transmission and different uh, dynamics aspect of it. So, you know, it's, it's a power management uh, kind of a problem. And, uh, but as, like I said, the, the complexity is way more than at least what I'm used to in, uh, in previous industries. And then the, the, the second part really is where the, most exciting aspect is really driver replacement and moving into autonomy. And you have uh, all the ADAS different levels that are coming in there and then uh, making sure that uh, we have a system that's, that's very uh, critical from everything that's going on and you don't, have, uh, you don't have like a human operator making the decisions. And then uh, 
the, the last one up top is really how all of these devices connect to each other. So there are requirements about you know, latencies. There are requirements about decision making. When I talked about domain controller versus zonal architecture, who makes that decision? Is it a central brain or is it distributed? And you see all of that have their implications, both from a system perspective, whether we're talking about fail-safe systems or from a processing perspective, how is, uh, software is going to behave. Uh, artificial intelligence and how machine learning is, is going to benefit all of this. So most of it you guys are familiar and you experience it in one way or the other. Uh, but really, uh, you know, the most important one is really the driver replacement. Everything is, drive, everything is focused towards that. How we, can we have systems and infrastructures and cities that uh, without any interaction from, from human operator, right? And then, of course, you have all the sensors aspect of it, you know, whether it's uh, vision, whether it's cameras, whether it's radar, whether it's LIDAR, and then all of the decisions that have to come through it. Now, you see the paradigm that I showed a few slides ago. There's lots of data in the cloud, and lots of these decisions are made or uh, the, the neural nets are trained in the cloud. But how do we position ourselves as NXP to benefit all of that processing in the cloud and then bring it to, to the you know, to the edge for, uh, for much timelier processing and much uh, economical processing. I talked about, you know, the driver, the powertrain aspect, uh, the environment awareness. Another aspect about safety is really driver and passenger monitoring. So, you know, soon we will have cars that have inward looking cameras. Uh, they can sense your, uh, I mean, obviously they can see what's happening on your face. They can sense your uh, your overall well-being, and if there are any issues with, with driver and operator uh, uh, wellness, that there, are, there are safety issues that kick in and safety mechanisms that kick in. And of course, security. Uh, not only is this is uh, something about an IP protection, but it's a safety issue. So you have, you have your family, you have your loved one traveling in those cars, you have uh, you know, customers, you have passengers. Uh, there's lots of data actually related to individuals in a car. You know, I mentioned the, the gateway. Uh, I mentioned, you know, personal monitoring. They can look at uh, the well-being or the behavior of individuals sitting, or the passengers or drivers, and then they can adjust, uh, uh, they can adjust the, the environment to make it more comfortable. What's even, uh, what's even I, I wouldn't say worrisome, but uh, some of these cameras can be very high resolution and uh, if you look at some a field that's completely, you would say, not related to this, the medical field, uh, there's lots of diagnosis can happen from the data that these cameras are, uh, uh, are actually capturing, right? So, so you have all kinds of data like that that are flying in the car, and then you don't want anyone to hack into it. First of all, it's personal data, obviously, but also there's safety aspect of it. You don't want the car itself being hijacked by a hacker and then uh, you know, just move around. I mean, just watch any, any one of the Fast Furious movies, you'll see what I mean. Uh, <clears throat> okay, performance. I mean, data has been generated at a crazy rate. Uh, so uh, some of you involved in, in these mechanics in the cars where actually they've been retrofitted by lots of processing. And you know, every company who's involved in this domain has it. You know that the data generated is, is just uh, tremendous. And it creates all kinds of problems. First of all, how do you transmit that data? How do you store it? Which parts are important? How do you calibrate the sensors to give you actually data that's actually usable? Uh, so all of that you know, gets into that space of you, know, you need to process lots of data. You need to store it. You need to protect it. You need to make sure uh, you know, you, you, at the end of the day you make uh, good judgments out of that and then uh, you know, it flows back into the design, the design kind of uh, paradigm. Then the network bandwidth. You know, I talked about data generated you know, while the car is driving, but also you know, what happens from a decision perspective. You need, high you need high bandwidth within the car itself to communicate with all of that and that's where you know, our gateway processes are come in from a domain controller perspective so that they can consume all that data and get the data in a timely manner where it needs to be so that decisions can be taken. And then just compute performance, I mean, we're all familiar with this. Uh, just because the algorithms are getting more and more complex, you would need really large processing power. And that creates all kinds of you know, other kinds of problems. You know, how, do you, how do you architect the whole thing? What's, what's the thermal 
uh, envelope? What's the, uh, uh, you know, how do you place these, uh, these processing cores? What's the bus structure? And so on and so forth. Okay, so safety and security, they're not optional in mission critical systems. Again, this is general uh, uh, statement about any mission critical system. And specifically for a car, which we're all involved in, we, uh, you know, we're very familiar, it's something that we can actually go and buy. And, uh, and then you see the, uh, the different paradigms from a, from a safety perspective, right? First of all, functional safety. Uh, and that, that's, uh, that's really part of NXP's DNA. We know how to make functionally safe these devices. Uh, anywhere from error checking to correction to redundant systems, uh, lockstep CPUs, all of that. And then uh, device reliability, this is where the partnership with the foundries come in, right? What is uh, either foundry or any of the foundries are doing to make their, uh, their process technology reliable and it doesn't stop there. What happens to, to the IP managers, the IP designers? What are the margins they're using? And then it goes beyond that even. What, what are the EDA guys doing to, to make sure that uh, you know, these devices will not have uh, defectivity based on, uh, you know, based on just the, 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 the manufacturing aspects of it? Then the safety, just in general safety. You have, uh, we don't want, like I said, zero is a very big number for us. We want to minimize these, uh, these accidents based on human error. So that's, way, that's where all the paradigms from a safety perspective come in. So uh, you know, all these systems, and some of it would be in hardware, some of it would be in software. Software would be distributed, hardware would be distributed. But what happens if, if, uh, if a driver suddenly feels sick or can't, uh, can't uh, you know, kind of drive the car anymore? There are different steps of safety, depending on the severity that kick in, basically with the ultimate goal of the, taking the vehicle to a safe location and making sure that the, you know, the help is on the way. Uh, personal data protection, I talked about that. We cannot have any of these leaked out, whether it's really just operational data of what people are doing in the car, what they're watching, to all the way to more serious stuff where, like I said, you know, your, your camera and your car can diagnose your, uh, your health. And of course, cybersecurity. We don't want anything to be hacked into all these complex systems. Now, you see the complexity. Uh, usually, one device with an Ethernet port or wireless port, it's, 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 it's hackable, and it's very easily hackable. And we know we've seen multiple examples. Now, imagine if you have you know, two, 300 of these devices in a car, everyone with a, with a connection, potentially an entry point to hacking. And this becomes uh, very critical to, to monitor. Okay, quickly uh, about Moore's Law. For me, I mean, the, it's been 50 plus years and uh, you know, phase one is really what the industry has been doing to, uh, to, to get to that next level of performance. You know, the, the focus has been mostly on all kinds of manufacturing techniques, whether from a transistor sizing to interconnectivity. You know, eventually right now we're in, uh, you know, we're in three-dimensional circuits. We move from FinFETs to you know, nanowires, nanosheets. So, but uh, it's almost like all the burden of getting more and more performance was on the processing, on the foundry guys. And then the design community kind of, uh, we are, we're taking advantage of that entitlement. Then we get this. And again, this is not something you, most of you are familiar with this. You know, the top curve is really the number of transistors. So more transistors mean more functionality, right? And up to a point where uh, probably 10, 15 years ago, every other dimension, whether it's performance, whether it's you know, frequency, whether it's just the power, we're scaling kind of uh, linearly. And you know, as the number of transistors increased, as we integrated more and more, all these uh, different metrics were kind of flowing in tandem. And then we started hitting uh, around the uh, you know, early 2010s. And then you see things flattening out because you know, everyone knows that if you have a you know, single core and then you add a second core, uh, even though if it's a different node and a smaller node, you're not going to get twice the performance. And then think about this challenge if you have you know, 16 cores, if you have 32 cores, if you have 64 cores, you're not going to get the, that kind of a multiplier. So then uh, same with power scaling. Uh, and then you see the number of cores started increasing uh, you know, for, for a typical your network processor, 16 or 32 cores, is not, is not out of the order. Actually, that's on the lower side. So what, what needs to happen now is really uh, 
the design community has to kick in and start looking at different paradigms of how to make this work. You know, how we partition the architecture, whether we do chiplets, what happens to short range, you know, high speed communications between die to die or chip to chip, what happens to these uh, heterogeneous computing platforms, right? You have different ISAs, you have uh, graphic cores, you have DSPs, you have neural net processors, you know, different or even different uh, machine learning uh, kind of hardwired algorithmic cores. You have, uh, you know, I have uh, <laughs> different type of ISAs from CPU perspective. Uh, so how are we going to, as an architecture community and design community, how are we going to make, you know, harvest the, the benefits from, you know, what the, the process guys are giving from, from a foundry perspective? So this is really where the challenge is, and there's, you know, lots of discussions going on and how to architect you know, the next, you know, the next chip and the next SOC, but also from a car perspective, it goes within the whole car, whether we move from domain to zonal and how all of this is going to look like. Software, I know we talk about software, you know, probably last, but software is the underlying most complex thing that has to drive this uh, to, to, to some extent. Quickly about our product portfolio, so lower, Lower left end, we start from the microcontrollers, and then we go all the way to the end of our Layerscape family, which is the network processor. So the good thing about this is different markets, different paradigms, different design points, and now NXP is going through a transformation where we're going to unify all of this. So the learning from all these different areas are coming together. And uh, what's happening is when you look in the car, you have elements of all of these products in there. Some of them will be integrated. Some of them we will take the common uh, elements of it and design different SOCs. So this is the, uh, the, the overlying, uh, underlying architecture I was talking about. So in the middle, you see there's uh, the common elements there. And then you can call it you know, chassis, chip infrastructure, SOC infrastructure, whatever you want to call it. But these are the common elements. And uh, you see the common stuff is really the real-time systems, the safety aspects, the security aspect. Then depending on which domain controller you're going into and which zonal architecture you're going into, you start adding more elements. So some of them would be uh, network processing kind of chips. So you will add the network processing elements. Some of them would be focused on the vision aspect. So you have uh, lots of vision processing, uh, you know, cameras, you have the, the the ISPs in there. Some of them would be purely radar aspects. So you will have, you know, depending on which side, the front, the side, the corners, uh, you have lots of elevation. So you would add that element. And it goes on and on. So this is something that uh, we are pushing heavily, not just within NXP, but also industry-wide. So that, again, goes back to the software complexity. And if we set this up right, and we are, uh, basically you can have the infrastructure ready, and you can do, uh, you can do these chips in a, in a fairly rapid uh, cadence. Our strengths, so basically safety and security is very central to us, and then you see the different, the three different areas that are coming together. So at the top is our uh, digital networking aspect, all the learnings that we had from a networking uh, uh, perspective, these are really large chips. You're talking two, 300 uh, millimeter square uh, kind of area chips where you have a very heavy footprint on processing elements, multiple ISAs, uh, large number of memory controllers, large caches that are you know, obviously for, for network processing. Then you go into the, into the lower left, uh, which is the i.mx family. It started from being in the microcontroller aspect, but now they're moving into, we're moving into infotainment, we're moving into this heavy processing. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the lower light corner, right corner where it's really the S32 platform where we have all kinds of the ADAS learning, uh, all kinds of uh, automotive elements that are going into there. So uh, if you look at all these three, from purely the architecture perspective and SOC perspective, there's lots of commonality there. So we're trying to bring all of it together. And to, uh, to really, this is my final slide. So what are the challenges? So we have this paradigm that's coming in from, uh, from an auto perspective. You know, safety, security is absolutely paramount. Uh, then you have these concepts where if, even if I restrict talking about the two major areas, which is the, the electrification and really the autonomy. Uh, 
And then, and then you, you superimpose that, which require you know, multi-billion transistor chips, large SOCs, uh, and then the, you know, these two paradigms come together. And then you see I was talking about complexity levels. It, it really adds to the complexity of what we're trying to achieve. So just some of the ideas of uh, what, uh, what we need to shift the thinking. First of all, we can't be in older nodes, right? Where, uh, where you wait till uh, you, know, you have a few years of, and I'm talking about the process node you know, from a manufacturing perspective, from a foundry perspective. You wait to an older technology, the, the fully qualified for auto grade, and if we do that, we will not have enough power, processing power. Uh, the, the chips would be uh, you know, extensively large so that we can't yield them properly. So we have to keep up with you know, what our colleagues on the consumer side and the mobile side are doing and go to the latest and more aggressive nodes. Uh, safety, and then the NCAP is, uh, is really the, is a new car uh, you know, acceptance program from, from Europe, and they're really into specifying you know, use cases, what safety means and what security means. So we gotta, we gotta go into that and then superimpose that complexity on top of everything else. Uh, all the processing elements have to have that paradigm. I talked about security a bit. Uh, extensive field data. Data is very important for us. You know, whether data that's generated internally within the organization, within the company, but also data that's uh, generated within the outside. And then, uh, and then you can see every other paradigm is, uh, is adding to the complexity. So uh, my message is really, you know, since being this is a test, uh, I might say something about test, okay? Uh, it's very, very important to, uh, the, I mean, the last point is really what's driving us, right? Move from defect per million to defect per billion, right? And no, it's not an Austin Powers thing, it's real. You know, we're, people are talking about, you know, 500 to 600 defect per billion kind of uh, defectivity and paradigm. And it's, it's becoming very challenging to meet all of that. Thank you very much. And, uh, Thank you. Uh, very exciting talk. Thank you so much, Kevork. Uh, we have uh, a certificate, handmade certificate for you. Uh, actually, I think he can read it. Would you like <laughs> I to can do read that? it? Yeah. This is actually very special because I, I probably recognize who made this. Yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm going to read it in Armenian. It says, "Shunoravorume uh, Kevork Keshishianin Nahaka Yervan Zorian." So you know Yervan. You recognize that. And. Uh, and then the, the, the Republic of Armenia, Washington, no emperor, das nirken, das nichos, yergozar, das nina. So basically it says, uh, congratulations, Kevork, that's me. You figured that one out. And then the president and the chair is Yervant. And then it's signed, it's signed as the Republic of Armenia, and then uh, the location is Washington and the date. Thank you very much. This is very special. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. I thought he can translate it for us. Thank you, Kevork. Uh, moving on. Uh, moving on, we will see that uh, what we're doing here is not only going through the sessions, through technical information, through the nice uh, keynotes, visionaries, panels, the posters that we will see very soon, but ITC provides us a very strong ability to have networking among us. That's one of the key reasons that many of you come here. Yesterday, we had the opportunity during the the exhibition hours during the global test forum that we visited together to do that. And the nice thing is that while doing so, we also interact with, with, with the keynoters, with the visionaries. I found a picture, the top one here, where the, our first keynoter, Mike Campbell, is visiting the global test forum. You see him there. Uh, we can interact with them there. Today we have, again, two more, no, today and tomorrow, two more sessions of the global test forum at 12 o'clock. 11.30 we do have the posters, and then we have the lunchtime at the exhibition floor. Again, another opportunity for us to interact. Speaking about interaction, the exhibits floor is the red square, the, the global forum is in the blue triangle, so don't forget those. And also, last night we had a good networking possibility. If some of you missed it, uh, did you enjoy it last night? Yes? Okay. <laughs> Very good. 
uh, yeah, it was fun. We were able to, to, to do lots of things there together, individually as well, as you may see here. But also, we were able to spot the keynoters there. We have our Adventist keynoter tomorrow, who was there enjoying himself with a nice photo, uh, as well as our keynoter from Volkswagen doing a selfie here in the corner. Okay, so we'll be seeing them on the stage as well. So just approach them, approach people who you know and who you don't know as well. This is our opportunity to network. Uh, also use this app. I am picking my photos from the app. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, we mentioned that we have these awards that we are announcing over the different plenaries. At this plenary, we'll be addressing two questions and therefore we'll be recognizing uh, two sets of individuals. The first one is who has the most publications in the last 25 years? ITC is a great forum to publish. We have many authors who have published uh, in the past 50 years, but we're looking at the 25 years because that gives us a possibility to do it electronically via Explore. So we search in the Explore. Joe, uh, so we will see that uh, soon, the answer after Joe's speech, uh, the answer to this question. And the second question is, which authors have published the most number of ITCs over the 25 years? How many ITCs we published in? 10? 15, 12 maybe, we'll see that again later. Meanwhile, let me stop for a second and introduce you to our visionary speaker, Joe Suwiki. Joe is the executive VP of Mentor, a Siemens company. Joe has been uh, in our community for some time. He's a leading expert in IC nanometer design and manufacturing. Previously, at Mentor Graphics, he was uh, in charge of the design to silicon products, including Caliber, DFM platforms, Tessent, but recently he has been uh, taking more responsibility. Now he's in charge of all the business units of Mentor covering IC segments. Uh, he has been with the company since 1990 when it was Mentor. Now it's part of Siemens, it's a Siemens business, and he has done his bachelor degree at the University of Rochester, his MBA at Northeastern, and he has an advanced management program uh, degree from Harvard Business School. Joe, please join us. So good morning. Um, 50 years, I have not been involved with this for quite that long. Um, but I was forced to remember as I was preparing the speech, it was 35 years ago when I taped out the first chip where I consciously did DFT. And I did hand insertion of scan circuitries, I did hand vectors pumping through the scan chains to do the tests. And that all sounds good, but I'm really glad we had relatively light management at the time because I did all that to test a 7,000 gate gate array, which might have been overkill at the time. Um, so, Kind of an interesting way, if you look at Kavork's presentation and look at mine, it's kind of looking at the same thing from a, two different angles. Um, it is our premise that one of the things that's going to deeply change what we need to do for test is the fact that we're really no longer going to be in an age of devices. It's not about a PC, a phone, a mainframe, a mini computer. It is really about these deeply interconnected systems. Whether you're talking about things driven around smart grid, industrial IoT, or something like perhaps smart city, is that these are trends that are requiring the aggregation of massive amounts of data across massive amounts of devices, across even larger amounts of chips. They have very big economic drivers behind them. You can see some of the data here that came from a study from McKinsey where you're talking about millions and millions of dollars available that can be delivered as value by the implementation of these systems, much of which can then be captured by companies that are selling into that market. Right now, the estimate is if we're looking out in 2023, you're talking about almost $200 billion that will be spent on the implementation of smart cities, about 25 billion of which will be spent on semiconductors. Now, you can start to see people going and chasing that opportunity when you look at where investment spending is going. Uh, the investments are going into 
AI and machine learning chips. We just heard a lot about that. And that's mostly driven on the fact that if you look at the amount of data produced, there is simply not enough electricity in the world to be able to process that data in a conventional von Neumann architecture. It needs to have more efficient approaches. It works, where it's spending is happening in high speed 5G, it's happening in silicon photonics to make the data center more effective, it's happening in sensors and MENS to be able to, be able to take the input from the world around you. All of this is coming together to try to create these overall infrastructures. And you can see that some of the ideas that are coming in place start to get, let's shall we say, a little exotic. You might have heard recently where Seberis talked about putting together a wafer scale AI engine that they're attempting to move into this market. Now, one of the things that is a truism is that in a device era, failure is inconvenient. I have a computer that's blue screening on me twice a week, and that's an irritation, but I've been putting up with that for about two months now. But with this connected world, it can be a little bit more consequential. I mean, this happens to be a picture from a train crash that occurred in China. It was caused by lightning, uh, causing some issues of fuses. But as we build these systems in place and try to make autonomy and software and the semiconductors manage the process, the types of failures that might have caused inconvenience in the past will become critical problems. Now, you can already see that starting to occur if you survey the IC industry. Uh, this is from a uh, research group, Wilson, that does on functional verification. And it just asks the question of, you know, what percentage of your designs are requiring functional safety? And if you looked at in 2016, it was about 48%, and that's risen to 59% in 2018. Certainly automotive drives this but there are other areas which are causing this to increase as well, medical, industrial. Uh, and I think, again, as that interconnectedness happens, this becomes more important. Now, what we see this doing is now, test becomes more critical throughout the entire life cycle. If you start to think about the needs to ensure that those devices are working in the first place, continue working or monitoring, have good reliability, you need to move from where we designed for tests and production tests, which have been fairly classic parts of our infrastructure, to doing things where test is, in, is in, important around doing yield ramp, which also has to do with overall reliability and efficacy of the process, and then moving this into an ongoing monitoring approach. Now, if you look at what we need to do as, a, as an industry, First off is that complexity will not go away. Um, it was good seeing Kevork's thing on Moore's Law. Moore's Law is alive and well. We've got another six years of fairly clean view in terms of getting to a five, three, and two nanometer node, which is as good a visibility as we've ever had. And so we're gonna continue to be able to do that level of integration, which we need, then need to deal with that complexity as a design for test uh, community. But we also need to deal with these issues of design for more than test, areas where we attack issues of quality, security, reliability, aging, that can cause then failures of the device that was perfectly functioning when it left the factory. So let's talk about the complexity first. Um, one, I want to really highlight one of the big challenges in one proposal we have moving forward, and that is that if you look at uh, the amount of transistors on the chip that need to get tested. I think we can all agree that's going to continue to increase. The issue is that as that increase of gate count is an exponential, pin count is a modestly sloping linear. And what makes the problem even worse is that most of those pins are no longer general purpose I.O. Most of them are becoming CERTES pins. And so you've got a lot more stuff hidden behind the pin interface and fewer pins to get into it. Now, in addition, clearly doing compressions and channel management is part of managing the issue of getting that data into the chip. Um, but right now, there's really kind of two ways it goes. And I'd guess if we asked this audience, you'd probably be looking at about 50-50. 
The easiest way to, to manage this, the least effort and the least impact on the design community is to basically do channel assignment up front, make your reasonable best case guess on how, much how many channels you need for each one of the hierarchical blocks within the design. But it is virtually guaranteed that what that means is that you'll have some of the blocks over assigned, some under assigned, and so there will be bandwidth wasted and therefore increased test time. Uh, you can do iterative optimization, where as the, does the hierarchical blocks become more mature, you can be running a lot of uh, DFT on those to then determine how much channel bandwidth they need, keep assigning those channels differently along the design, probably drive your place and route crew nuts, but if you do that, you can get things optimized for the best test time. It's just painful. Uh, what we as an ecosystem are working on right now, and this is cooperating with things people like Teradyne and Avantest, is to put in place a system whereby we can use these CERTES pins to drive test data. And so you use the same transceiver that the the pin itself is used. But then as an alternative to the CERTES protocol that will drive the data is that you have a different uh, protocol encoder that has customized uh, protocol for test and that that then drives a hierarchical stand network. What does this do? One, clearly you get easy access to additional pins, new ways to drive data into the interface. But this programmable hierarchical scan network then allows that to be programmed as part of the test development. And the channel management is done by the network itself. And so both of the problems get solved, is that we able to, are able to optimize the use of all the bandwidth to minimize the amount of test time, and do that by coming in through 30, 30 chips, utilizing the 1149.10 interface. And so we got really strong support going on for this right now through the industry, and we think this is going to make a major impact in terms of how we can effectively manage tests as these devices become more complex. Now let's talk a little bit about this design for more than test error. Um, one example of something we're doing right now, and then we'll talk a little bit about some things I think we need to start imagining as we look forward. So if you look at part of the issue we're having here is that um, we've got very effective process R&D teams that occur out there to deliver these nodes, but each one of them ends up bringing what was a secondary or tertiary physical effect starts to become a primary one. And over time, we continue to get more and more uh, effects that over time can cause either continuous degradation or sudden failures in devices. And this ends up increasing the frequency of failures out in the system that as these things become complexly interrelated, need to be found and managed. Now, one example of that would be in the autonomous driving domain. Uh, we have already have um, devices that have built-in self-tests that can run tests while in operation in the car. Uh, the problem gets exacerbated, though, when you look at the autonomous problem. Um, it is certainly enough for you to throw out a signal error on an ABS system, and the timing on that certainly might be able to wait for a second, two seconds, three seconds, because I'm not always hitting full power braking. But as we go to autonomy, especially level four or level five, the amount of time it takes to be able to throw the error that says someone needs to take control of this vehicle because the semiconductor is failing becomes smaller and smaller. And so it's not just the efficacy of the test, it is the speed of the test that becomes important. And here's where um, some new technology that's coming out, which is called observation scan. What it does is that rather than classic LBIST, where you use the LBIST to drive your, chan your, your scan chain, then do that as a test each individual complete scan chain load, is that observation scan adds some additional circuitry that will enable us to pull off data as it's being scanned. And what this does is it gives us, we've seen commonly 10x reduction in terms of overall time, far fewer patterns, faster detection, and interestingly, because that's one less set of 
uh, operations of the devices, this can also help minimize the amount of aging that happens on the device. And I think these types of approaches where we modify what we have done for production tests to take in, in, into realization the uh, needs of doing these tests that are actually out in the life cycle is going to be an important part of research and development as we move forward. Now, the one thing that I'd like us to step up for a level and think about is that if you look at what DFT does, it fundamentally has three different phases. There's a design analysis phase. In classic DFT, what we do is analyze the design to determine uh, what type of faults can be controlled and observed. There's an IP generation insertion. IP generation, when I first started, was me drawing, inserting scan logic and connecting them together. Uh, now it's the insertion of automatic scan chain generation. It's the insertion of uh, compression uh, algorithms. It's the insertion of these scan networks. It's gotten more complex, but it's about putting in this additional circuitry that enables us to do effective test. And then finally, there's this aspect of doing automatic sequence generation, where after we've analyzed what we need to figure out, after we put in the IP that allows us to, to work the circuitry, we can then figure out what we need to actually drive into that circuitry through the IP to figure out the things we analyze. But I think you can extend that out to a bunch of different things. Um, there's one interesting case we can bring up, which uh, ST worked on, and I think Dolphin's been doing a lot of work lately, which is that rather than scan circuitry, which captures the state of a design that enables you to tell whether or not the circuit functioned in that last clock cycle, what they're putting in place is circuitry that can capture the timing window that's occurring for the design. And what that lets them do is, is be able to, with very good accuracy, determine whether or not aging is causing issues in speed performance. I think that's just one example of an area where you can think about how we can take those concepts of DFT and extend them out into new areas. Now, it's not just going to be the unintentional failures. We also need to start thinking about how this technology can reach forward and look for intentional type of intrusions. I absolutely loved finding this one being someone who did DFT 35 years ago for the first time, where you can go to a conference to learn about how to hack and exploit a medical device. I don't have one yet, but I'm not sure that I want one now. But this whole aspect of whether it be safety, security, aging, reliability, these are all aspects where we can go and look for how we can use the knowledge we've gained over the last 50 years and extend that into a new era where we're attacking more than just is my chip working when it's shipped, but how my chip is going to work overall in the overall production life cycle. So with that, I thank you for your time and look forward to talking with you during the next day or two. I've so been there. Yes. Okay. Here you go. Picture Congratulations. Right there, Picture is there. Thank you. Yeah. That's wonderful. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we have the answers to the questions that uh, you're waiting for. Uh, the first question was, um, who has the most publications in the past 25 years? And we found out it's not one person, it's a set of people. So we put some threshold level, and the threshold is over 50 papers. So over 50 papers, we have two authors who qualify with over 50 papers, and they are Chris Chakravarti and Janusz Rajski. Okay, congratulations. I know Chris is here, he's attending the session. Mm, yes, Chris, you stand up, please. Congratulations. With over 50 papers. Uh, Janusz, unfortunately, is not with us this year, uh, but we'll congratulate him separately. And then we have over 40 papers. Uh, Sudakar Reddy. Uh, Sudakar also is not here, but Irith is here. Uh, Tim Cheng uh, and Sean Blanton. Okay, again, congratulations to all of you.
as you know, getting into to publish in ITC is not easy, and having so many papers over the last 25 years is, is tough. So uh, just to remind you, there are various places one can look for the papers. In our case, what we're doing, we're concentrating the search on IEEE Explore, and uh, Jay, who has done all this study, will be telling us about the process in the next plenary session, the process of extracting and how we, we reach those results. Now, the final one is, which authors have published in the most number of ITCs? How many ITCs did they come to? Out of the last 25, because that's available in Explore. Out of those, we have people who publish more than 20 papers, uh, uh, more than 20 years, meaning, out of the 25. Okay, and uh, in this club, we have, again, Janusz, we have Sudakar Reddy, we have uh, Jurek, uh, Sean Blanton, Tim Chang, Krish, Sandeep Gupta, and Steve Sunter. Congratulations to all of you. This is 20 years out of the 25, which is over 20 years, that is. Um, with this, I'd like to uh, remind you that after the conference, we have three workshops coming up. Uh, the automotive test and reliability one, in case you are not registered yet, please do so. Uh, we have the one on machine learning, a new one on the robust and trustworthy, that is secure machine learning. Very important one, very nice papers there. And then we have one on emerging memories. We see many of us moving to emerging memories. Uh, we need to look at those in terms of technology, design, and test. MRAMs, RAMs, and so on. So if you're interested, please be there as well. Okay? Thank you so much.